Hey guys, CB Super. Welcome to the second episode of Fusion Basics. If you haven't already seen the first episode, go check that out first before watching this one because we're going to build upon everything that we went over in episode one. We're going to just carry that on into episode two, and I'm not going to be covering everything that we already went over. That being said, let's go ahead and jump right into it, and we're going to talk a little bit about node structure, and for that, we're going to jump over into the Fusion tab. So before I even jump over there, uh, all I've done so far is I've taken this Robin footage that I found on Pixabay and I've just dropped it into my timeline. Now let's go ahead and jump over into the Fusion tab. And you might be noticing that I have less tabs than maybe you have. I am using DaVinci Resolve 16. If you want to get rid of any of the tabs on yours, all you have to do is come up to Workspace where it says show page, you can just uncheck any of the ones you don't want. Say if you didn't want the color tab, you uncheck it and now the color tab is gone. Also, you may be noticing that I don't have any grids. If you don't want grids in your composition, uh, I don't use grids in my composition because it doesn't work well when you upload it to YouTube. It gets, uh, it looks pretty, it looks a little fuzzy and gross. So I usually just come up here to the uh, Fusion Fusion settings and on flow and you can just uncheck this show grid right here. Now you may have to delete whatever clip you were working in and then your grid should be gone. First thing I always do when I jump in here is I just right click and I come to arrange tools and I make sure that to grid is checked just because even though the grid isn't showing it will still align to the grid and it'll keep your flow nice and straight. All right so now that we're in Fusion this is what my default Fusion page looks like usually. Uh, you'll notice that we have a media in and we have a media out. If for whatever reason you don't have a media in, it may be because you're actually inside of just a Fusion Comp. If I jump over to an actual Fusion Comp, you'll notice that there is no media in. And that's just because the media in is the actual footage. The media out is just whatever you'll see. So if I was to bring in, say, a background node, plug this into the media out, maybe color it red, now when I jump over, you'll see that I have a red background as my footage. So for right now, we're just going to stay with this uh, Robin footage or whatever footage you're working on should be fine. It should be the same. So this is our flow. We have nothing in between the media in and the media out. But anytime we put anything in between the media in and the media out, as long as it's connected to this background flow, it will show in the media out. Likewise, if I was to, say, put some kind of text on here and then jump back over, now that since I've attached it to the flow, we now see that the CB super text is superimposed or merged on top of my footage. So basically, anything that's in between or leads into has to be plugged into this media out. So even if I was to disconnect this from the media out and then jump back over, you'll know, notice that I see nothing because now nothing is plugged into that media out. So it still has to be connected to the media out. And for whatever reason, if I accidentally deleted this, all you have to do is shift space, type in media, and you can just replace it with a new media out. And it'll work just the same as if you never, you know, deleted it in the first place. And now you'll see that it's all loaded up again. So that's pretty simple. And I've accidentally deleted the media out several times. I'm gonna go ahead and delete this text node. As we talked about in episode one, we have the media pool we have the effects library, clips. We can jump on clips if we want to jump to another clip that's on our timeline. And then of course the nodes panel. So the effects library is where all of your nodes live. Now you also have this handy toolbar where your most commonly used nodes there. And some people like to actually get rid of this and you can, you can get rid of it. I wouldn't recommend getting rid of it right now because we're gonna be using several of these nodes uh, in the next couple of videos. But you definitely can, and once you learn all the names of the nodes, you can start using the quick select of shift space, and this will bring up a select tool window. And then now all you have to do is type in the name of the node that you're looking for. Say if I'm looking for the TV node, all I have to do is type in TV, I can hit add, and that's gonna drop in the node that I want. The only downfall is that you actually need to know the names of the nodes that you're looking for. So if you don't know the names, then you're probably gonna to need to come up to the effects library, hit tools, and then start looking for it based off of what kind of node you're looking for. 
And we're going to go into each and every single one of these nodes in the upcoming videos. But for now, all you need to know is that this is the effects library. And to access the effects library, all you have to do is click on the effects library, open it up. And anytime you have, you see this little icon over here, this little down arrow, if you click on that, all that's going to do is it's going to extend it to the full length of the screen. All right, so that's the effects library. Likewise with the media pool as well. If you uh, click on this, it's just going to extend it all the way down, and now you can see your power bins. All right, so the media pool. Um, let me go ahead and delete that TV node. The media pool is where all your media lives. If for whatever reason you wanted to bring in, say, another copy of this Robin, if you bring it in, you'll notice that it brings it in as a media 2 or media in 2. Now, it's not the only way to bring in media. Of course, I can always just drag and drop media as well. I can just take this media and I can drop it right into my node flow. And that's gonna bring it in as a media. Uh, and it also will upload it into your media pool, which is pretty neat. Um, I don't really need that right now and, and I don't need this in there. So I'm gonna to go to remove selected clips and I'm gonna go ahead and delete this media too for right now. Okay, so let's talk. Let's go ahead and get rid of the media pool because when you're not bringing in media, you don't necessarily need the media pool there. You'll notice on the right side of the screen, we have all these other editors over here. So the first editor you'll see is the spline editor, and we're going to dive more into the spline editor and the keyframe editor in later videos. But just know that when you animate something, this is where you're going to probably be spending most of your time finessing and refining your animation. Same with the keyframe editor, um, it's here. I have lots of videos that involve the keyframe editor. You can go check those out, but this is kind of gives you a layer view of everything that has keyframes inside of it. It also shows all of your footages and you can come in here and you could uh, adjust timing a little bit here and there. And it's, it's not the most intuitive way to work, but it is available. And we, there are certain things that we will do inside of the keyframe editor. But for right now, just know that when you click on this, it drops the keyframe editor. You probably notice that there is this little screen right here. You can make this bigger and smaller. This is essentially just a little map that shows you uh, any time that you have gone and extended outside of the view where you can see all of your nodes. If I was to just move this outside, this little uh, map pops up and just lets me know that there are other nodes that are outside of the view. If I wanna get rid of that, all I have to do is click the V key. I usually don't have that up, but um, it is an option, and then again, if you want to see that, you just click the V key again. So There's also the Metadata tab, which I have never once used, but the Metadata tab is there if that's something that you're looking for. And then finally, the Inspector. The Inspector is probably the single most important pane because this is where you will modify all of the characteristics and parameters of each individual node. Now, in order to load your node into the Inspector, all you have to do is you can double-click it. You can also single-click it. You can select it. Uh, there's, there's a bunch of different ways. The only thing is when you select more than one node, you may have to actually double click now the actual node that you wanna be able to interact with. So let's go ahead and take a look at this node here first. Every node is essentially a single tool or an effect. Of course, there are exceptions such as grouped nodes or macro tools that may have several different functions and tools inside of each node. But for the most part, all of the nodes that you pull out from the effects library are going to be a single tool or an effect. Now, there may be several different effects inside of that one tool, but Fusion is going to recognize it as one tool. So inside of that tool, let's go ahead and disconnect this real quick and we'll just look at this one node. I'm holding the command and I'm just scrolling in just a little bit just to see it. We'll take a look at this is the media end node. Now, as I hover over it, we'll see that uh, it gives me that little black box with several, you know, different little characteristics down in there. You'll notice that the depth is 32 float. It's GPU, it has the data, it's 1920 by 1080. But you'll also see that there is this little box down here with these two circles. Now that's the viewport indicator. If I want to load this into the left view, all I have to do is click on this little button. Now you'll notice that nothing happened, and that's because we only have one viewer up here. If I want two viewers, I click on this little button right here for dual viewer, and now they will load up. This will be your left view, and this will be your right view. I can also click on this little right view button and you'll notice that it loads it up into both viewers. Now we can see that it's in the viewer because it's indicated down here with these little white circles that are inside of these circles. So that just lets us know that it's in the viewers. Of course, we can also load it several different other ways. Let me go ahead and bring in another node to kind of demonstrate 
how this could actually be useful though. One thing I like to do is I like to try and keep whatever is my background in a level field all the way into, I'm gonna go ahead and scroll out just so I can see that media out. And I'm gonna load this into the media out. Now you'll notice that it's red and it's red because it's not loaded into the viewer and so it doesn't really know what to do right now. Sometimes you have to load things in individually to get them to update. All right, so let's say that I want this media in which is our Robin footage to be in that left viewer. You see it's already loaded into the left viewer. And let's say I want this background to be loaded into the right. So to load this background into the right viewer, there's several different ways I can do this. One way is I can, of course, click that right view button there. I can do that. I can also right click this and I could say view on right view. But you notice there's also a hotkey of two. So I can click this and that will load it. But I can also just click on it and click the two button on my keyboard and now it will load it into that. Now it has loaded it, we can't really tell because it is actually a black background. If I was to change the color in the inspector to red, now we can see that it is a red background. Now you'll notice that I also have this merge. Just because I'm selected on this background does not mean that I have to view this, whatever I've selected. I can actually load this merge into this right viewer and I can do that by just grabbing the merge and I can just drop it I'm holding that left mouse button and I drop it into that viewer. And now it has dropped in the merge, which is the merger of this media one in with this background. And I've loaded it into the second viewer. Now, even if I select this background, I can double click it and whatever, it doesn't really matter. I can now edit this background. Say if I wanna edit the color, I could do that. But I'm viewing the merge of this background on top of this foreground. Now, and I know that's confusing. This is a background node. This isn't in the background, this background generator. Think of it as like a solid colored generator that is superimposed on top of our media footage. Now this merge node is interesting. The merge node does pretty much one thing and it does it really well. What it does is it merges a foreground object, which happens to be this background or color generator. This, whatever, whatever object is in the foreground on top of whatever object is in the background. And it gives you several different apply modes and operators and blends. Blend is simply just like an opacity slider. If I was to turn the blend down, it basically just lets the background continue to go with no foreground merged on top of it. And obviously, if I was to put this at halfway, that's 50% of that red color is now being merged on top of whatever's in my background, which is my Robin footage. Now, that concept is very important because that is basically how every node flow works inside of Fusion. So if I was to, say, delete this background, you'll notice that this merge node now really does nothing. Even if I play with the blend, it doesn't really matter because it's not merging anything on top of my footage, it's, uh, there's nothing plugged into it. But let's take a look at the actual node itself. You'll notice that it has several different inputs. And let me go ahead and disconnect everything real quickly and then you'll see a little bit more about what I'm talking about. And I'm also gonna bring in some text. Now the text is just gonna be sitting here. It's not doing anything just yet. Now if we take a look at this merge node, it has three different triangles and one square. Now the square is the output. Every node has to have an output because that is how it connects to the rest of the flow. Some nodes also have inputs. Most nodes have inputs of some sort. A merge node has an input, has a yellow, a green, and a blue square. Now the blue square, anytime you ever see a blue square, it's for a mask input. And you'll notice that our media also has a mask input, but it also has a yellow and a green input. Now we already know from the last video that background goes into the yellow input. So foreground would go into any green input. And anytime you see a green input, it's for a foreground object. Likewise, anytime you see a yellow input, it's for a background. So if I take this media and I just simply load it into this merge node, just by holding my left mouse button and dropping it in there, it's gonna automatically load that into the background node. But that's not the only way you can do that. You can also, let me go ahead and remove that. If I hold the right mouse button and I do the same thing, it now gives me options. It says I can either drop it into the background, the foreground, or the effect mask. Let's say I wanted to drop this into the effect mask. It will do just that. 
Now it's not going to show me anything because this isn't really an effect mask and there isn't anything that's loaded into this merge. So it's really kind of pointless to do that. But I can also drop this in to the background node. Now that does do something. That drops it into the background and now I can take this and I can load it back into the media output. The output goes into the media out and now our fusion composition has been reconnected. Although this merge node isn't really doing anything because a merge node, again, without a foreground object is pretty much useless. So let's go ahead and take this text, which if I load this text directly into this viewer, we'll see that all it is is the word CB Super. Now, it, mine says CB Super, yours may say nothing, and that's because I've set my default to be anytime I bring in a text node, it now drops it in the word CB Super. Uh, and in order to do that, all you have to do is type in whatever you want over here. Maybe I want this to say text. And now all I have to do is right click, I can go to settings, and I can save default. Now, anytime I bring in a text node, it will bring in the word text that's already inputted. Now I've also upped the size and I've messed with the tracking a little bit, but that's just how, if, if for whatever reason, every time you bring in a text node, you wanna at least be able to automatically see the word text, that's how you would be able to set that as your default. So that's a, that's a handy little trick. So in order to load this text into the merge node, again, we can just take the output. So this time I'm gonna hold the Alt key. The, I'm gonna left click and grab the output and drop it into the merge. Now by holding the Alt button or Option key, it basically did the same thing as if I was to grab it by the right mouse button and drag it and hold it. Now I'm gonna drop this into the foreground. Now, I don't really see the, uh, the combination or the merge of this, so if I want to see this, I can grab this merge node and I can just drop this in, and now I see that the text has been merged on top of my footage. Now, I know this seems very basic, but this is very, very important that we understand that the background is going to continue all the way to the media out, and everything that we place in between these two is going to be superimposed on top of our footage. Now, of course, we can always come in here because we see that this media in node has a mask input. So we can actually mask out this video footage. So there's several different ways to bring in nodes that we've kind of already mentioned. Let's go ahead and take a look at those ways really quickly. So there's obviously this toolbar here. If I select this media in node with my left mouse button, you'll notice that there's a red cursor around it. Well, now if I was to hit this, say, ellipse tool, it's going to automatically connect the ellipse as a mask to this media in. Now you'll see that the video footage has been masked out. Now if I was to jump over to the edit tab, you'll notice that it masks it out and it automatically puts a black background as the very lowest layer. And so that's kind of important to know, but in reality, it's actually transparency. So if I was to render this out in a format that accepts transparency, this would be transparent so that we would be able to put this on some other type of footage. Now let's go ahead and take a look at what that might look like. I'm gonna take a new fusion composition and I'm just gonna make it a little bit longer just so it will cover this entire footage. And I'm gonna go ahead and jump over to fusion real quick. Now, remember what I said in the last video that because there is footage on top of it, it will automatically go to the footage that is on top. So we're gonna to have to go to clips and we can go to this actual fusion comp to go ahead and jump over to the fusion comp now we already have a media out. I'm just gonna bring in a background real quick and connect this background. And instead of a black background, we're gonna make it red. Now let's go jump back over to this and you'll see that it was in fact transparency and now we have created a red background that's behind our footage. And so that's just a demonstration. We don't need to keep that up there and I can go ahead and move this back and we can get back on with the tutorial. I just wanna show you that anytime you see these gray and darker gray checker pattern in the back, it means transparency. Now we could obviously merge in a background that would be behind this. We can do that several different ways. But before we get into that, let's just go ahead and continue on with the several different ways we can bring in a note. You'll notice that I brought this ellipse in just by using my cursor and I press the ellipse key. But let's say I wanna add another mask. All I have to do is either press the ellipse key and add another mask. Now you'll notice that it has added those two masks together. But look where it's added it. Added it actually in between. So if you click on this ellipse, it doesn't really give you any options on how to connect those two masks. But if you click on the rectangle, you'll notice that it now brings up this paint mode and it gives you a merge. Now we're not going to go too deep into masks today. I actually have several other videos that are just on masking. 
if I was to say subtract this, now what we've done is we've essentially subtracted that one mask from the other mask, but merged it with the media in. And that's just a way that you can get drastically different masks just by you know connecting them and then using like a boolean or a, a merge operation inside of these before they even go into the media node. Just delete those for now and I'm going to click off the clips. Let's talk about how we can also place nodes. Let me go ahead and delete this merge node with this text. One thing I like to do is I always like to have this media out in one of the viewers and I'll usually take whatever foreground object in. I usually drop that into one of the other viewers. So in order to get this text into the flow, there's a couple different ways we can do this. Hover over all of these in your toolbar and you'll notice that they all have different names. Um, this is the merge node. So if I want, I can just bring in a merge node. Holding this merge node, I can hold down the shift button and you'll notice that it will let me drop it into this flow. And you'll know that it's dropped in correctly when it highlights blue. If it doesn't highlight blue, it just means that you're going to drop it and it's not actually connected. So if you hold down the shift button and you move it around until it's highlighted blue, now it's connected in and it's going to automatically connect it into the background. Now if I move it around, you'll see that it's moving the entire flow around. Now I can simply take this text and I can just drop it into the merge and it will automatically merge it into the foreground. And now you'll notice that I have the text merged on top of the footage. All right, let me go ahead and delete that real quick and I'll show you another way to do this. You can take this text node holding down the left mouse, I can go ahead and grab the output and I can just kiss it right off the back end of the output of the media node, automatically add in a merge node. It'll merge whatever object you have onto whatever object you're merging it onto. So this will be your foreground object, this will be your background, and it will merge the two together. Likewise, if I was to, let me go ahead and delete this and unconnect this, bring it in a little bit closer so we can see it. If I was to take this media and I was to drop it on the text node. Now the text will actually be the background and the media will merge on top of the merge node. Now the media will merge on top of the text, which doesn't really do me any good because the media is obviously larger than the text. Now if I've done that, one way I can reverse these two is just by hitting command T. And all that does is that reverses the foreground and the background outputs. And now I can reconnect it to the media node and I now have my correct composition. There's obviously another way. We, we can go ahead and delete this and delete this. Now, if I have this media node selected, if I was to just hit the text node, you'll notice that it automatically merges text on top of the media using a merge node. Now, it might not always make it in the most organized fashion, but it is a very simple and fast way in order to get text on top of your media just by loading the media out into the right viewer, now we see that we have a correct composition. Likewise, I can also delete this. With the media selected, I can shift space. Because I know that I want a text node, I can just type in text. Now you'll notice that the first option it gives me is a text 3D node, which is not the node that I want. So sometimes, even though you type in the correct node name, you may have to actually search around for it. So you can either use the arrow keys to go up and down and find it, and you can hit the enter key to add it, or you can just click on it using your mouse button and then hit the add key, and now you have your text node merged again correctly. You can also, of course, just um, click on the media, and then you can click on a merge node, and then click, click on a text node, but the problem with that method is it's going to create another merge node. Even though you and I both know that all we wanted was to put the text into this merge node, when you do that, it's going to merge every, every object using another merge node. So we can go ahead and just Command Z that, and we can bring in the text node with nothing selected, and now all we have to do is reconnect it. All right, so let me go ahead and delete this and show you something pretty neat. You can also use text, and we're going to get into this text a lot more in later videos, but one thing you can do is you can take this text and you can drop it into this media output, and we can drop it into the effect mask. You've cut out your media footage using your text. Because your text has an alpha channel that's built into it with the exact text, and we'll go into alpha channels in the next video, just understand that a lot of different nodes can be connected to other nodes in surprising ways. All right, so let's go back and we're just going to take this text node and we're going to drop it into the media out. 
And now this is our composition. Now I don't necessarily need two viewers. So if I want to get rid of one of these viewers, all I have to do is click on either one of these buttons, either the single viewer two, or I can do the single viewer one. I want the single viewer two because that's the one that I've already have loaded into it. And I'm just going to take this media out and I'm going to make sure that it's loaded into because all I want to see is the final composition while I work on this text note. For whatever reason, if your computer is running very hard, you can always come up to the playback and you can come drop down to a proxy mode and you can turn it to either half resolution or quarter resolution. Uh, I'm going to leave mine to off for right now, but this is very important because it will allow you to work inside of Fusion, but when you render it out using the delivery tab, it's going to render it out still in a high quality mode. So it won't necessarily show all of the jagged lines or the, or the drop down resolution. And that's really important because it allows you to work fast, but not have it crash on you or, you know, computationally too heavy that will slow you down and not be able to play back in real speed. So if I was to go ahead and play this, you'll notice that it's playing back at 24 frames a second, which this video is in 24 frames a second. So it's playing back at pretty much full speed. Now it may drop down a little bit here and there. You'll notice that it dropped down to nine frames at one point. So if I wanted to, I could go ahead and drop the playback down. I can also right click on this and I can turn off high quality or motion blur and it will still render in high quality and it'll still render out the motion blur, but it just won't affect me in the playback, which is kind of nice sometimes. And sometimes it's absolutely imperative that you actually do that because you just won't be able to work in real time. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the inspector panel here. So if we start at the very top of the inspector panel, we'll notice that it says tools and this shows you which tab you're actually on. So modifiers is grayed out and anytime you see something that's grayed out, it just means that you haven't activated it or you can't click on it just yet. To the left over here, we have this little red button. If I turn that off, all it does is it turns off that merge node. And so essentially anything that is connected to it via that merge node is now going to be turned off. That can be really important when you're trying out different versions of things, or if you're wanting to see something, but you don't necessarily want to process all the way through your composition in order just to see one effect that's along in your composition. So let's go ahead and turn that back on and let's take a look at some of these other keys. So the first one is set color. This, all this does is it just changes the color of your bar here. I'm going to go ahead and clear the color. You'll notice that some of these nodes are different colors. So your media is going to be blue. This text is a generator, so it is green. If I was to bring in another color generator or a background, you'll notice that it's green. And that's because it's a generator. It generates something. It actually creates something. Same with the text node. It creates something. Therefore, it has a green a merge node, which is a utility. You'll notice it's in gray. So several different nodes will have different colors. That'll play in later when you start looking at a very large node tree and you start trying to figure out what does what. And it's, maybe you're looking at somebody else's composition. You'll be able to tell that, oh, well, this is something that generated something. Because once you start to rename some of these nodes, it gets a little bit more difficult. And we'll talk about a couple different ways you can organize things so that somebody else will be able to look at your node flow and tell exactly what they're supposed to be looking at. So let's go ahead and load this back into here and click on this text to load it back up into the inspector. By normal, it's green, but say I didn't want that green. Maybe I want to change it to something that there is no other color for. Maybe I change it to violet. Now all of my text node will be violet, but if I bring in another text node, you'll notice that it is now green. So I'm gonna go ahead and command Z that. It only changes the color of the actual node that you're connected to. So I'm gonna go ahead and clear that color out. Let's look at this next button. This is versions. Now versions is very important because you're gonna start using versions later on, probably not in a basic function, but what versions is gonna allow you to do is it gives you instances, different instances of the same. Maybe in a version two, if I click over to version two, let's say I want a different, probably not that font, but let's say I use a different type of font. All right, maybe that's the font that I want. Well, I can jump over to version two and I can jump back to version one and you'll notice that I have six different versions to choose from. Let's say I want to show this to somebody else. I want to say, hey, this is version two, click on version three, and it may even be a different version. So maybe version three will be like my typical uppercut. Maybe version four would be even something else. So I would give somebody multiple different versions to look at 
And you can change everything about this version. You could even change and animate the versions differently. And it would give somebody options when looking at any different nodes. Or this next button is the pin button. And what the pin button does is it, it pins this to the inspector. So even if I was to click on this merge, now what I would see is I still have this, I, the merge would still be on top, but I still see the text. And this is really nice because sometimes you wanna pick whip or let's say I wanna change this tracking and I wanna go ahead and enter in maybe an equal sign to, to open up the, uh, the expression window. And now I wanna take this and I wanna connect this tracking to this blend. I don't know why I'd wanna do that, but let's say I did. That'd be an easy way just by using the pin and now I can come back into this merge, and if I was to blend this down, you'll notice that it actually affects the tracking, which, you know, I don't know why you'd ever want to do that, but for whatever reason, we'd... I'm going to go ahead and Command Z that. So that's the pin function, and pin function is uh, very important. Um, you'll notice that it highlights. If you want to turn it off, all you got to do is not, so now it won't be pinned. All right, and then let's go ahead and click on the text. That'll basically just load the text into the, uh, to the inspector. And then there's also the lock button. So if I press the lock button, all that's gonna do is make it now so I can't, it's just so you won't accidentally start adjusting this. You'll notice all the functions are now locked. This is nice because there might be some nodes that you have inside of a Fusion Flow that you don't want somebody else to mess with or that you don't wanna accidentally mess with yourself. A lot of times where I'll use this is actually in uh, transform nodes where a special transform node Maybe I've renamed it and I don't want to accidentally use it for some kind of animation, which may mess up my workflow. So that's the lock button. If you want, you can just undo that lock button. And then of course, this is the reset button. All that's gonna do is gonna reset everything back into your default. The nice thing is that it resets it back to your default that you've set, not the Fusion default prior to you setting your new default. All right, so that's all the buttons up here. That's the versions. Um, there's obviously several other different things that we can do inside of this text. We can essentially change everything about this text. I'm not actually going to go into the text node itself. I just wanted to show you these buttons up here that are inside of the viewer. And um, now we're going to jump into modifiers because modifiers are very basic, but they can get very advanced. So inside of every node, you'll notice that there's usually this modifier tab. In order to access that modifier tab, you actually have to modify something. So in order to modify something, all you have to do is, let's say we want to modify this size. Well, all I have to do is with my arrow over the size, the actual word size, I can right click. It'll create this little panel, this window, and you'll notice that there's this modify width. So I can come over to modify width and there's all these different things. And I'm not gonna get into what each one of these does right now. That's actually a bit more advanced. I will just show you the shake modifier. So let's go ahead and click on the shake modifier. Now what this does, if I was to press play, you'll notice that the size is connected to some type of modifier and it's doing it in an automatic fashion. Now I have a video that's actually on the shake modifier but you'll notice that this is no longer grayed out. It actually allows us to click on the modifiers and we can come over here and we can actually modify or change the characteristics of this shake modifier. Um, I can also turn it off. If I wanted to turn it off, all I have to do is click on that red button just like we did on the tool section. And now when I press play, it no longer modifies that. The problem also is though that because it is modified, uh, you now cannot see it or access or change it. So if you wanted to get rid of that modifier, you would just right click again. And all you have to do is come down to the remove shake one and you would be able to remove that. And now you can you know, go on about your day. So one thing that Tony Gallardo said in one of his videos was, is that you really need to just go over everything and right click every single thing, because you're always amazed at what you'll find uh, these different tools and functions that pop up when you right click on something. And this is absolutely true. Uh, there is a lot of information that is out there that exists on learning how to use Fusion. Like there is no one place that tells you how to do everything. And so sometimes you'll find things that you didn't even know existed just by right clicking and looking at all the different settings. All right, so that is the modifier parameters and how to change characteristics and versions and modifiers inside of that. Let's go into the node flow. 
So we kind of talked a little bit about the node. This is the node flow, and this is a composition all in itself. We've taken a, a piece of footage and we've superimposed this text and we've merged it on top of the background, which is the, the bird footage, and it plugs into the media out. This is a fully encompassed composition now, but I can also copy and paste nodes. And I can, it doesn't have, I don't just have to copy one node. I can actually copy entire fusion compositions. Say I want to select this text node. I can command C or control C if you're on a PC and I can command V and that is going to copy that text and everything that I've edited about that text. And it's going to paste another node or duplicate node of that right next to it. Now I could also, let me go ahead and delete this. I could select and I'm just holding down my left mouse button and I'm selecting this entire, both of these nodes. I can now command C that and I can command V that. Now this is not connected. Okay. I still have to connect this manually or hit the, hold the shift button down when I do that. And so now I have this other text node and let's say I want to move this text. Just all I did was I, I click on this text and now I can use this, uh, this, this transform. Maybe I want to move this down a little bit, maybe size it down, maybe track it out a little bit. Now you'll notice that it's merged the exact same way because I copied that merge, but that merge node as well. But there's another thing we can also do. Let's go ahead and we'll select this. I'm going to go ahead and command C this instead of pressing command V, I'm going to hold down the shift key and then hit command V. And now that's going to create an instance node. Now you'll notice that there's a little green line that connects to this and anywhere I move this, that green line will show the connection. And all that green line is telling me is that this node is an instanced version of this text node. Let's go ahead and load this one up by itself. If I was to change anything about this text node, it will also change this instance text node because these two share a connection. They share a bond where they are identical nodes of each other. Now you can use this in several different ways, but you can also de-instance anything about this text node. Let's say I go into this text node, I load this into the inspector, I can right click on the size and I can come down to where it says de-instance. Now you have to de-instance any characteristic separately. That being said, now if I was to click back over to this text, I can move this text and you'll see that it's moving this other text, right? But if I change the size, it doesn't change the size of that de-instance text. But I didn't de-instance the tracking. So if I change the tracking, now that changes it in this text. Now that's super important because you're going to be able to use this essentially as a driver of this node over here. It's going to drive all of the characteristics. Let's say you want this one text node to drive several other instance text nodes but you want this node only to control, say, the color. Now, when I change the color of this node, you'll notice that it changes the color of all these other text nodes. Now, we use this in several other videos, and I'll show you how to use this in a much more advanced function, but just know that you have the option of Command-C, Command-V, pasting a node, but you can also Shift-Command-V to create an instanced version of that node. And that's, that's as far as we're going to go into instance for right now. But I just want you to understand that does exist and you can do that. I'm going to go ahead and reset this node back to its original. All right, so let's talk a little bit about organizing. Keeping your flow organized is not only important, but it's kind of imperative, especially if you're going to hand this over to anybody else to look at or if you're going to just make videos for the web. You can go back and look at almost all of my videos and you'll notice that I am not very organized. So this is kind of counterintuitive for me but I will show you a couple ways to stay organized. One obviously is that if you right click and you go to arrange tools, you can arrange it to grid. You can also arrange it to connected. Um, I usually just leave it arrange tools to grid. There's also an auto arrange. If you want to use that function, you can, that will arrange just the look on the grid. There's a couple other things we can use. So let's say I want to take this, these two nodes that are connected, or you know what, even let's just say we have this and we have like several different, other nodes. Now, this obviously isn't the best way to do things, but let's go ahead and I'm going to give myself just a little bit more space so we can kind of see. And I'm just going to move this up. One thing you can do is you can group several nodes together. Uh, let's say I just want all of these masks 
group them together. So I'm just going to command G all of those and that loads them all into one group. And you'll notice all it's done is it's just taken all of those together and it's just loaded them all up. Now, if I go ahead and right click on this and I can expand the group, which you can also do command E, that's gonna go ahead and just open that up. Maybe I can just move this over here to the side and it's already added like an underlay to it and it's grouped them together. I can, um, I can also uh, click on this group here. I can right click and I can ungroup this pretty simply. Just go ahead and click on the ungroup. Now that's ungrouped them. I can select all of these. I can shift space and I can type in underlay. And all it's gonna do is it's gonna throw down this, this little box here where I can kind of organize all of these individually inside of this box. And I can even rename this box. Now, it's a little finicky in that if I was to click on this underlay box and I wanted to rename it, if I was to rename it with this box collected, you'll actually notice that it's selected all of these nodes and it's going to rename all of these nodes as well as this box. So one thing you're going to have to learn is that you're always going to be holding down the alt button if you want to select just the underlay itself. If you want to rename anything, it's just F2, but uh, unfortunately on a MacBook, you're going to have to hit the function key in order to hit F2. And now I can just rename this to masks group. Now that is actually going to be grouped together. But now the nice thing is whenever I just click on this underlay, it's now going to move everything around. You can also add points inside of any one of these flows just by holding the alt key down and, and pressing on the flow. It's, it's going to add in a pipe router. Now you can move this pipe router around to make it just a little bit more functional. And the nice thing about pipe routers is that you can also use them as outputs. So you can use this output from that and now pipe it into this mass background. And now you'll notice that we've created some kind of like logo thing, which is pretty neat. I'm gonna go ahead and delete that and load that back in. So that's one way you can just kind of make things a little bit nicer. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and delete that node pipe router for right now. And I'm also gonna show you another thing. Let's go ahead and shift space and we can type in the word sticky. And that's gonna add a sticky note. All right, so these are just notes. Um, uh, all you gotta do is double click on it, put your cursor in there, and I can just type in that this is the mask group, group, group. All right, and then you can put these, you know, pretty much anywhere in your flow. So anybody, or even yourself, if you come back to a flow, you know, maybe months later, may not remember like why you had left these mask groups out here. Well, this, you can leave a little note on there that is going to stay inside of your fusion composition. And it will let whoever know that, you know, uh, it'll, it'll tell them whatever they need to know maybe about this mask group. Uh, and lastly, one of the most important parts about organizing is just making your flow so that it makes sense. What I like to do is I like to have the background pipeline pretty much as straight as possible. And it doesn't have to be uh, left to right. It can be, you can, you can do this right to left if you wanted to. Um, it doesn't really, it doesn't really affect it too much. By default, it usually, um, you know, it makes a little bit more sense to me that it goes left to right. And that's just because I live in the United States where we read left to right. So it makes a little bit more sense to me, but um, you can also have them go top down and you can actually change some of these settings inside of Fusion settings if you want. Uh, that'll automatically yeah, change this. So whenever you do flows, it'll kind of go top down. Personally, I usually leave mine going left to right and I'll usually have the media in will be the farthest thing to the left and the media outs will be the farthest things to the right. Sometimes it's nice that you can have all of your foreground objects maybe above your background or below. You can have them above and below and try to keep the merge nodes all in the background pipeline. There's going to be several times where you're going to have merge nodes inside of your pipelines and that's fine too. Just try to make things look as neat as possible and that way when you go back into this fusion composition weeks or months or years later, it'll be easy for you to take a look at what you've done and quickly figure out what you want to do next. All right, so that's pretty much it for the basics of using the nodes inside of Fusion. In the next episode, we're gonna dive deeper into the effects library and we're gonna start talking about the different types of all these nodes and what they do. If you haven't already done so, make sure to like and subscribe, hit that bell notification, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks.